Hello everyone, my name is Lucas Nascimento Ferreira and welcome to my PhD dissertation defense entitled Controlling Neural Language Models for Effective Music Composition. I want to first thank the dissertation reading committee, uh, which is formed by Professor Libby Lelis, Professor Marilyn Walker, and my advisor, Professor Jim Whitehead. I also want to thank CNPq, the Brazilian funding agency who funded me for the first four years of my PhD dissertation. Well, I want to introduce this talk by saying that neural networks are currently the leading method for music generation. Okay, and briefly how they work is you give these networks a bunch of uh, examples of music pieces, and then they learn compositional rules that you can later use to generate music. Okay, how do you generate music with these networks? Well, you give a certain note as input, and then the network predicts the next note in the sequence. By doing that many times, you can get a complete piece. Okay. So, well, that's nice, but it's kind of hard to control these uh, methods if you want to control the features of the music. For example, imagine if you want to generate a happy song or a sad song, right? It's not quite obvious how, you do, how would you change the parameters of this network to achieve that goal. And this is particularly important for the field of effective music composition. Uh, so we should ask ourselves, why do we even care about controlling emotions in music? Well, I think one of the good arguments is that you know, by doing that, you get closer to modeling human creativity. And there is a whole field uh, dedicated to that called computational creativity, okay? Um, it's also very important to create systems that can control emotions in music because then that helps us better understanding the relationship between music features and emotions. Also, this uh, obviously can support a new um, range of music applications varying from generative soundtracks, sonification, and music therapy. And for example, you can just think of a, a system that can generate soundtracks for movies or games in real time by uh, <clears throat> adjusting for center, certain emotions. Well, uh, so now it's a good time to put out my thesis statement, uh, which is uh, this dissertation explores how to control neural language models to generate music with a target emotion. Given the limitation of label data, the focus of this work is on search-based methods. Um, that use music emotion classifier to steer the distribution of pre-trained musical language models. Okay, this is a wordy sentence, I know, but what is important here, there's three major parts. Uh, <coughs> Search-based methods um, that control music emotion, that use the music emotion classifiers to control musical language models. Okay, so uh, this is the outline for this talk. I want to briefly uh, give a more background on uh, generating music with neural networks and then move uh, towards the first, uh, the main three papers of this dissertation. Um, and later I will conclude this talk uh, discussing bits of uh, pieces of this work. Okay, let's get back to this, this example here. Um, I wanna briefly formalize how these um, networks work. Basically they work as neural language models. Uh, and what does it mean? It means that um, <clears throat> your data set is actually organized as these X and Y pairs where uh, both X and Y's are nodes. And what the network's trying to do is predict a note, note Y from X, okay? And <clears throat> the architecture of these networks are normally RNNs or transformer networks, okay? And they have a softmax um, activation function as the output layer. Um, so let's see as an, with an example how we can learn uh, to generate music with these networks. So we start by processing the first example. And here, this example is encoded as this um, vectors here called one hot vectors. So you give that as input, and then the output is the probability distribution over the nodes of the vocabulary, right? And what you wanna do during training is compare that with the ground truth distribution, which in this case is Y1. And we do that using a cross entropy loss. So this is a measure for us on how close we are towards the, the, <coughs> the real the real, the ground truth distribution. So we do that for the second example and the third example, okay? And at the end of training, we get this probability of the next token x t given the prior um, tokens x1 to x t minus 1. Um, so we saw how we can generate music briefly before, but this is how it formalizes how it works. Um, so you give a certain note as input, and then the, the network outputs the probability distribution over the next nodes. And one way of picking, selecting the next node would be just to pick the node that maximizes likelihood, which is in this case is this second one, 
with 0.7. So then you concatenate that uh, selected node to the previous input and you repeat this process, getting uh, the next node again, in this case would be the first one. And you do that uh, until a certain number of times or until you find a special token that finishes the piece. Okay, so this process is called greedy search. And let's look at it uh, using a tree, a tree search uh, structure. So starting with, certain, with a given node, let's assume there's only three possible nodes in our vocabulary, right? So <clears throat> when you're expanding this first node, we using greedy search, we pick the one that maximizes likelihood, which is the middle one here, all right? Um, and then now you move to the second step, which is this one here. And note that um, we completely disregarded the, the top and the bottom branch. So we are in the middle branch here. And now according to greedy search, we pick the one that maximizes likelihood again. And this one would be uh, the top node here. And our solution is this one, okay? But uh, if you pay a little, a little attention here, you'd see that the actual optimal solution is on the top here. And greedy search completely missed it because this 0.9 node here is kind of hidden behind this first option here, okay? So one way to solve this problem is using beam search. So beam search, uh, when, it's, when it's expanding the nodes, um, what it does is it, it doesn't only keep the top, the top, uh, the best node, but the B uh, top nodes. And B here is a parameter called beam size, right? So now we're gonna keep these two best candidates. And when you're moving to the next step, now you have these two branches to look at, uh, the middle one and the top one. And out of the six candidate solutions here, we're gonna pick the two best ones uh, again, and those are this one and this one. So now we can compare which one is the best uh, by just multiplying the probabilities here, and, and we found that this one is the best, so now we found the optimal solution. So beam search works nice in practice, but it's not guaranteed to find the optimal solution in every, uh, in every um, search or search problem. Um, but, and as well, it has, it's known that beam search can be repetitive if you're using it to generate uh, sequences. Another potential problem is that um, beam search is deterministic. So if in your application you want stochasticity, if you want to generate different variations of pieces given the same input, uh, that's not uh, the solution you want. What you probably wanna use is um, sampling strategy where you give the note as input and now you're gonna pick the next note by sampling according to the probability distribution of notes. And well, this is nice, it gives you some variety, but um, you might be unlucky during your sampling process and then you might actually end up selecting kind of bad notes uh, in, in, during generation and you don't want that. So to solve this problem, you can use something called top case sampling where you keep an argument K equals to three, for example, and then you only sample from the top three uh, notes in your vocabulary, right? So this gives you some variety, but uh, guaranteeing some quality, right? So with that background, we can now start discussing you know, how to control um, emotions in generated, music generated by these networks, okay? So I think the first thing you have to do is to even consider how to encode emotions uh, in these models. So in the literature, there's mainly two uh, models of emotion. We have categorical models and dimensional models, okay? So as a categorical motion, uh, a categorical model of emotion, we have a good example of uh, Aikman, Aikman's model, which divides the space of emotion into six basic emotions. And as an example of dimensional model, we have the circumflex model, which divides the space of emotions into two axes, valence and arousal. Okay, and then every single dimension or every single emotion in this space uh, is represented by a pair of valence and arousal values, which typically are range from minus one to one. Um, another important difference here is perceived versus felt emotion. And here's an example. Uh, when we look at this character, we can perceive it as anger normally uh, because of some visual cues here, right? You have the fists closed, we have the open mouth and the fire in the hair. Right? So we can objectively perceive this, um, this emotion. Same, the same uh, works here, right? For the second character, it, like this character is cringing, so we can perceive it as uh, having fear. And, and so again, it's uh, another objective example. However, when you're feeling an emotion, it's much harder to describe what's going on with you uh, <clears throat> to explain that emotion, right? So that distinction is important because um, normally most of the systems that generate music, they are concerned about 
generating music that is perceived to have certain emotion and not necessarily making people feel that emotion. Even that would be possible, it's much harder. Okay? So from now on in this work, when I talk about emotion, I'm talking about perceived emotion. Okay, so with that, now I want to explain how we tackle this problem. We, in our work, we have a music emotion classifier, which is a second model that guides a search procedure. And the goal of this procedure is to steer the probability distribution of the notes of the language model. And we try to do that in two, two ways, right? Well, first way is by optimizing the weights of the neural, neural network uh, before the generation uh, of the music. And we also try that, uh, that search during our, our at generation time by optimizing the, or by steering the probability distribution of the language model with the music emotion classifier, okay? So uh, with that background, now we can move for, uh, to the first, uh, first work of this dissertation, which is entitled Learning to Generate Music with Sentiment. And this work was presented at <clears throat> the Izmir conference in 2019. So this first work is heavily inspired by the work of Redford et al. And what they did first, they pre-trained a single layer LSTM language model to predict the next character. Uh, in this Amazon product reviews here. So this model is a one, has one layer and is predicting the next character in this product reveals. So after that, they fine tune this LSTM language model by adding a, a linear layer here to the model, <coughs> which outputs one and zero uh, for classifying sentiment on a second data set called the Stanford St Sentiment Tree Bank. <coughs> And what they uh, showed is that during that process, when they use L1 regularization to train this network, um, the network um, put all the, the sentiment signal in just one, in one neuron of the LSTM. So that was very interesting because what they could do then, they could manually tweak that neuron, like, like manually change its values to control uh, the LSTM to generate either positive or negative sentences. So let me read on an example so you can see um, how this works, right? If you put uh, as, a, as an input, I couldn't figure out, the network would complete the sentence as I couldn't figure out the shape at first, but it definitely does what it's meant to do, okay? So this is definitely uh, some positive um, sentence here. And then you have another example with the same prime sequence, but completing to be negative. Now the sentence completes to, I couldn't figure out how to use the product. It did not work. At least there was no quality control. This table does not work. I would have, this tablet does not work. I would have it give it, I would have given it zero stars, but that wasn't an option. So also clearly negative continuation. This was very cool. So we decided to do that for music, but to do that, we had to first uh, create a data set of music annotated according to emotion. At the time we started this work, there was no um, public data set available for, uh, for this type of work. So we created the VG MIDI data set which is a media data set uh, with piano arrangements of video game soundtracks. And this, this um, data set has, um, it initially had 95 labeled pieces, at least for this work. Later, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna extend this one. And then it has, um, at this point, 728 unlabeled pieces. And all the pieces were labeled according to the straight complex model of emotion. And since in this work here only, um, <clears throat> In, we are only interested in sentiment, we mapped sentiment from the valence dimension of the circumplex model. These two figures here show examples of the pieces in this data set. So to annotate um, those 95 labeled pieces, we created this annotation tool where human subjects would listen to a piece and then drag around this circle, uh, around the, the circumplex model, and in real time, as they, um, as they click on that circle, the piece would be played and their task would be to carry um, that, that circle around, um, <clears throat> picking the emotion that they perceive in each part of the piece or each uh, instant of the piece. So uh, to label each piece, we, uh, we hired 30, annotations, 30 annotators via Amazon Mechanical Turk. So they, they listen to, so 30 annotators listen to every single piece. And uh, because, um, people can perceive emotions differently in music. We assumed that there would be three clusters in this process. Uh, the first cluster would be the positive cluster or the, the second cluster would be the negative cluster and the third cluster would be the noise. And noise here means people 
that just took the task in Amazon Mechanical Turk um, and for maximizing pro pro profit. So they didn't really care much about the quality of the results. And um, our goal here is to find a good, a good um, final label for this piece. So what we did was, um, uh, we, after getting these clusters, we picked the cluster that had the major number of people. And, and then in this case, here's cluster one. So then we picked, um, we just computed the mean, the mean of that cluster to be the final label of that piece. And in this case here, this piece has a positive valence uh, throughout the, the entire piece. Um, okay, so with that data set, then we can uh, follow the steps of Redford at all. And so we pre-trained this single layer LSTM uh, on this uh, data set, on the unlabeled pieces, sorry, of the VG Media data set to predict the next word in, in the data set. And here word means um, tokens that we created to encode the MIDI, the MIDI pieces. Right, so if you look at this figure here, uh, this sentence here is um, representing the very first two time steps of this piece or of this measure. And uh, for example, this token T underscore 120 is uh, representing this uh, setting tempo um, event here to 120 BPMs, all right? So the architecture of the LSTM is exactly the same. And now we got a language model out of this, okay? Uh, so next step is fine-tuning fine that LSTM with the labeled pieces of the VG Media data set. And, and now what we do is similarly to Red Ford et al, we add a linear layer, we stack it on top of the language model through the cell state of the LSTM. And the first thing we do is actually evaluating um, the accuracy of this model as a classifier before, before doing anything else. So let's do that. Um, so we, we did this by um, separating a training and a test set uh, on, the, on the labeled pieces. So then uh, we compared our model, which is the fine-tuned LSTM plus the, the linear layer against a baseline LSTM, which has exactly the same architecture, but it didn't have that pre-training step before. So it was completely fully trained in a supervised way on, only on the labeled pieces. And that baseline method got an accuracy of 60.35%. Whereas our method beat that by uh, 20, roughly 29% um, <clears throat> in, in accuracy. And this is a very nice result because it shows that we can boost the accuracy of, of linear classifiers by just using, using um, untrained uh, or unlabeled data. And in this case, particularly important because labeling, um, labeling emotion in music is um, to some extent expensive. Um, okay, so now with that result, we can see what happens with our uh, neurons, right? Uh, what is the distribution of, of weights for, for the sentiment signal? And here, uh, unfortunately, we didn't get this single neuron carrying sentiment signal. We get a more um, balanced distribution of, of weights. And exactly what we got was this distribution. And <clears throat> there, was, there was 161, 90, uh, neurons activated for that task. So we couldn't manually tweak a certain value to get different sentiment. So what we did was we used a generic algorithm for optimize, to optimize those 161 cell states um, that were responsible for sentiment signal. And here the genetic algorithm works as follows. We have this population of noises we call um, that are like small values that we're gonna add to those 161 states to um, kind of steer the distribution of those the neurons a little bit, okay? And then what the way we evaluate this, uh, the effect of this um, is by using a generated test fitness function where we pick an individual, we add that uh, those noises to, to the current weights of the network or to the 161 units and then we generate 30 pieces. And the final fitness is just the rate of pieces that were generated or considered positive um, by, by the linear classifier, okay? And as, as genetic operators here, we used an average crossover and uniform mutation. Uh, okay, so after that, after optimizing the weights of the net network for positive and negative, we generated bunch of different pieces and we we took three random pieces 
out of the two groups, positive and, and negative. And then we, we ask human subjects to have annotate the species, again, using the same process, that, using the same tool that we, we designed for the VG Media data set. And 30 people did that evaluation per, per piece. So here are the results. Um, <clears throat> here, for positive pieces, uh, indeed, the human subjects, they agree with the system. They agree that the pieces are indeed positive. However, um, for the negative pieces, there is uh, more ambiguity going on, right? Kind of half of the pieces, or half, uh, one half, one part of the pieces tend to be positive, the other one negative, and on average they stay around this uh, neutral era, uh, uh, neutral um, valence around zero here. Uh, so let's, let's look at some examples. Right now it's a good time to hear some music. A second example, now it's a negative piece. Oops. Okay, nice. Um, so with that, let me oh, okay. Let me conclude this by saying that we presented a generic algorithm that optimizes the weights of the L1 sentiment neurons um, of, of the language model, and then we, as part of this work, presented the VGMD data set, and as a result, we got that human subjects agree with the positive pieces generated by the system, uh, but negative pieces tend to be a bit ambiguous. All right. So let's move to the, to the second work, um, which is called Computer Generated Music for Tabletop Role Playing Games. Okay, and this work uh, was presented both at age 17 and age 20. So at first, we presented this system called Bardo that selected background music for tabletop role playing games. And it works by taking the player's speech uh, on the table and uh, <clears throat> sending that to a speech recognition system that generates captions for us. And these captions are classified by a story emotion classifier. So then what we do is we have this pool of, of music or library of music annotated according to emotion. So we pick uh, hand author pieces that have the emotion as given by the, the classifier. Uh, so in this work, we introduced part of composer that generates background music for tabletop RPGs. And the system works uh, very similarly. The main difference is that now we have this algorithm called stochastic bioobjective beam search, which um, <clears throat> controls a language model using a music emotion classifier. And these pieces are generated for each caption that comes um, with certain emotion. And then we play that back to, to the players uh, around the table. So at first, to classify these emotions in stories, you created this data set called Call of the Wild, and is a data set of a D&D campaign with nine episodes played on YouTube by four different players. And we got these captions um, automatically from, from YouTube using this speech recognition system built in the YouTube. And, uh, and then we annotated this, <clears throat> this each, each caption on these episodes according to four emotions, uh, calm, suspense, and agitated. And there were three annotators here per, um, per episode. OK. Uh, and we use this uh, categorical model of emotion because that uh, was judged to fit better um, than the D&D campaigns. And then what you had to do is to make this work with the VG Media data set, we had to map uh, that that um, model of emotion to our circumplex model. And we did that by picking the, for example, an emotion here, calm, and mapping to a quadrant of, uh, of the circumplex model, right? So for example, calm here is mapped to um, one zero, which is uh, right, bottom right, okay? And suspense is mapped to zero zero, which um, actually is, is um, left, top, top left. 
right? Um, okay, so then we trained a story emotion classifier, which is a BERT architecture that is fine tuned to, to classify emotions in that call of the wild data set. <clears throat> So the way it works is this is a pre-trained BERT, which is also a language model. Uh, we stack a linear layer on top of it to get a classifier that outputs either one or zero. And, and then we do the same for arousal. So here we separate the dimensions. We have two models, one for valence and one for arousal. And then we combine the results to get the final emotion. We do, we do the same thing for the music emotion classifier, but now we have a uh, high capacity GPT-2 model, which was trained on the, um, which was trained, pre-trained and then, and then fine-tuned with the VGMD data set. Um, so the fine-tuning was this way. We had a linear layer similar to the previous model um, to get the valence um, classifier. And then we had an arousal classifier very similarly, and we combined these two to get uh, the output emotion. Here is important to highlight that uh, we extended the label pieces of the VG Media data set from 95 to 200. Uh, okay, so with these two models, now let's talk about how the SBBS or Stochastic Bioobjective Beam Search works. Okay, so it takes a sentence as input and then it runs through the story emotion classifier to get an, an emotion, let's say agitated. And then uh, now with the target emotion, we start generating the piece <clears throat> and, and we start with this, let's say with this input note here, which can be a melody, but or, or more notes. And we get to the language model, we get the probability distribution over the notes in the vocabulary. So then we here use top K to just consider the top um, solutions in, in this space. Uh, here, don't, don't confuse this with top K sampling. We simply just pick the top K solutions. We don't sample, we just select top K. Uh, we run that through the music emotion classifier. So all these top K solutions. And the classifier is gonna give us a probability, a probability of, of, that, of that sequence here of two notes being of the emotion agitator, okay? So for each, for each um, sequence of two notes, we get, we get a probability. We then multiply that probability by the probability of the language model. And, uh, and then we sample. So now we sample from this uh, result here and we sample B candidates. In this example, we are using B equals to two. And remember this is based on beam search. So it follows that same, same structure. Uh, now our beam has two candidates. So <clears throat> when you feed that into the language model, we get a two independent probability distributions, one for each, for each candidate. And then this same process happens in parallel. Um, we, we pick the top case solutions and we feed that through the music emotion classifier again uh, with the same uh, end goal and, and emotion. And we get these probabilities of, the, of these continuations being, being agitated. So we multiply that again by, by the results of the language model. And uh, now out of this 10 here, uh, 10 candidate solutions, we sample two. Okay, and, and the process repeats until, until uh, we generate a piece that has the same length uh, of, of the, the caption in, in seconds. <clears throat> so here I should mention that we are sampling and not, and not picking the best one because you want to have some stochastic in, in the process, okay? So um, what we did to evaluate these models was we first had these accuracy experiments where we evaluated the accuracy of the story emotion classifier and the music emotion classifier using a cross-validation approach. Um, so here uh, we have two models. We are comparing BERT, which is our model against NB, which is the naive base model we used previously in the first version of Bardo. Uh, and here we have the results for valence and arousal independently. And in this cross-validation approach, uh, for example, when you, we did uh, leave one out, uh, we you leave one out cross-validation, which means that we, if you're testing on episode one, we are using episodes from two to nine to train each model, okay? So <clears throat> the, here are the, the results for naive base uh, for the violent, valence dimension. And we got an accuracy of 80% on, on average and BERT beat that 
uh, model by 7%. And we can see here that on episode seven, which is seems to be the hardest episode of all of them, uh, Bert um, had a better performance, a much better improvement in terms of, of naive, naive base, okay? When compared to naive base. These are results for, for Rausa, and the same thing happens here. Um, it turns out for episode seven, Vail Arousal doesn't seem to be that hard. It's actually uh, one of the easiest uh, ex uh, examples. But again, we got an average uh, improvement here, a little bit less of 6%, okay? Or sorry, uh, five, 5%. Now for the music emotion classifier, uh, we did an experiment similar to the one of the previous work. Um, here we have a test and a training set for on, on, out of those 200 label pieces of the VGBT data set. And then um, here we compare, sorry, here, here we compare the, our model, which is fine-tuned GPT-2 uh, against the fine-tuned LSTM, okay? With the same, uh, with similar size. And we also compare these two models against their baseline versions. And baseline here means uh, similarly to what we did in the previous work, where we train the, the models without the, that pre-training step, right? We, without this fine tuning, we just, just completely trained on a supervised way. So the results are as follows. Um, we have um, that the fine-tuned fine LSTM uh, outperformed uh, the baseline LSTM uh, by some amount. And this is good because this agrees with the results we got in the previous work that unlabeled data uh, tends to, to boost the model a little bit. And here the improvement wasn't that, that much, but, um, but uh, looking at the, the GPT-2 model, we have this improvement uh, again and the fine-tuned GPT-2 actually outperform all the other models, okay? Um, all right, so for the listening test, here we are interested in, in asking human subjects if they can perceive emotion transitions in the generated pieces. So what we do is we ask them to listen to a piece and answer, uh, two questions, okay? So they would listen to this piece and say, uh, and then and respond to this question, which is what emotion do you perceive in the first part of the piece? And then they had these four options. And the second question is what uh, emotion do you perceive in the second part of the piece, okay? And they would answer these questions after listening the entire piece, okay? So, or the two entire two parts as a whole. So there were two groups in this experiment, the group A and B, and each group listened to one method. Um, group A uh, listened to composer pieces and group B listened to baseline pieces. A little bit of the pieces, they contain exactly one emotion transition into them. Um, this came from, from one snippet of the Call of the Wild episode, uh, or different, from different Call of the Wild episodes, and each piece had 20 seconds on average. So uh, the baseline model is, um, it works as follows. Whenever there is an emotion transition in the piece, a human composed piece from the VGMD data set is selected at random. So we are comparing our method against um, um, these <clears throat> transitions between, between human emotion, human composed pieces, which is exactly what the original Bardo was doing. Um, so here in this table, it's a large table, but let's, let's break it down, right? There were, this, this table is gonna show the percentage of participants that correctly identified the valence and arousal intended by each method. Um, so here we have five episodes, episode one, two, three, four, and five. And each episode has two parts, okay? Part one and part two. And each part has two dimensions, valence and arousal, okay? So let's look at the first episode. Here in the first episode, Actually, compo Composer outperformed uh, by a little bit the baseline uh, on part two completely and part one for, for Arouso. On, uh, on episode two, we got Composer uh, outperforming the baseline uh, or having a more, more agreement. 
sorry, uh, people agreed more with Composer than, than Baseline for, for part one and for arousing part two. On episode three, the human subjects agreed completely with the baseline, uh, much, much more of the baseline than, than with our method. For episode four, uh, again, the baseline had more agreement than, uh, than Composer. We, we, we had more agreement only on the arousal dimension of part one. And on episode five, Composer had more agreement than, than baseline for part one and arousal for part two. Okay, so this table is kind of complicated to analyze as a whole. There is a lot of different, a lot of variables in here. So let's look at the average results. Um, so on average, baseline and composer actually perform exactly the same. So this shows that human subjects, at least for this experiment, could um, they could perceive emotion transitions as accurately in both systems, accurate, similarly in both systems. Okay, so this is a good time for, for listening to some music. And here are some examples of music that um, SBBS can generate. This is uh, a music from Agitated to Suspense. Okay, this is a very interesting one. I really like that, that climax, climax that, that occurs in the middle of the piece. So this is an agitated to calm one. And this is suspense to agitate it. Okay, so now let me conclude this work. Uh, so we presented Bardo Composer, which is a system that generates background music for tabletop RPGs. And as part of this work, we proposed stochastic bi-objective beam search, which is a decoding algorithm that controls a language model with a music emotion classifier. And uh, we conclude that subjects identify the emotions of the generated pieces as accurately as they identify the emotions of pieces composed by humans, okay? Cool, so now uh, let's move to the third and final work uh, of this dissertation, which is called Controlling Emotions in Symbolic Music Generation with MCTS or Monte Carlo Tree Search, okay? And this work is, uh, we, we are actually, we're still working on it to submit it to the AAA conference this month. And okay, so let's let's start. Um, in this work here, actually heavily inspired by Alpha Zero, which is this very famous system that could taught itself from scratch how to master the games of chess, shogi, and go. And in, for each of these games, it beat the world champion. Um, and, uh, and and this was really quite quite an uh, important result. Okay, so the way very briefly the the way Alpha Zero works is it learns um, uh, how to play a game by playing against itself. And it does that through a process uh, of using MCTS search. And in the search, there is a neural network that guides, um, that guides this process, okay? So imagine this uh, board here, we start the game with, with an empty board. So to take a first action in this game, what, what the system does is it runs an MCTS. Uh, with the current neural network, which initially is a random network. <clears throat> but so it plays that game according to this random network. 
Um, and then uh, and then it takes a move uh, after the search procedure. And now we go to the second state. And now uh, a new search uh, occurs, right, with, with the network, same network. And then we do it again until we reach the end of the game, right? And by the end of the game, we have a winner, and which we're calling here a Z score, right? It could be either like player one, player two, or a type. You can think of this minus one, zero, or one, for example. Um, and this Z score is back propagated um, to update the weights of the network. So this is a training step of the network. Um, and here is what, what happens is for each, for each of the nodes in this game, we're going to uh, use it, the z-score to update the weights of, of the network. And this network works as follows. It, it takes as input uh, the raw the raw board, for example, S2 here. Then it outputs two values, uh, V2 and P2. P2 is a probability distribution over the actions you could take um, in a certain state. right? And V2 is, is a probability value uh, describing what is your chance of winning if you are winning the game, if you are at that certain state, okay. So by doing that, uh, at the by by training the net network this way, uh, you have a good policy to play the game uh, after a few iterations. So the MCTS process uh, or the search procedure on every state works uh, using the predictor upper confidence for trees method, which is for short called PUCT. And QCT formula is th this one. Um, what is important here is that the Q values, um, which, which they are expected to be rewards um, that are computed from the neural network. Okay, so this, you can think of this as the V value that the network outputs, um, which is the chance of winning uh, at that state. And then the P values is this policy values or the probability distribution over actions. Okay, so, so then, what what we do is we use that um, we use those p values of of the network uh, as this um, term here in the in the equation, and here n n is the distribution of node visits. So every time you visit a node in the search, you increment uh, a counter, and that um, n of n is capital N of n is the number of visits for node n. And then after some simulations, uh, what you get is that um, the, the distribution of node visits is actually a better act or a better approximation for the policy, right? So then we can actually sample from the number of visits to our sample actions from the number of visits, uh, and that would yield a better a better, a better uh, policy for playing the game. Okay, so to apply that method to our work, what we did was, as usual, we, we trained a language model. And now we use the music transformer architecture, which uh, is a recent, a recent transformer architecture specialized for music and language modeling. And, and here uh, we increase the number of pieces of the, of the MIDI MIDI data set, or the unlabeled pieces, from 768 to, to 3640. And um, the, encoding, the encoding method we use here is slightly different. This, we call this an expressive encoding system because it's actually a much larger uh, vocabulary. It has around 44K uh, tokens because now uh, a token has um, three values. It, so every token here represents a note and each note has this uh, pitch values, which has um, the duration value and uh, and the velocity, which is the pressure uh, of, of, of playing that note. And if you combine all the possible MIDI values, or not all, but, but if you combine a large number of, of MIDI values, you, you would get this large vocabulary. Um, all right. So second, as usual, we also have a music emotion classifier. And again, this follows the same step. We get a fine tuning step with a linear layer. Uh, on the cell state of the music trans oops, uh, it's not a cell state. Um, okay, and, and here, what we do is we now, our model of emotion is similar to the SBBS model. We have the four quadrants of the circumplex model 
as categorical emotions, E0, E1, and 2, and E3. And you can think of zero being the top right model and going counterclockwise. You have one E1, E2, and E3, okay? So the classify outputs a distribution over these four emotions. And with these two models, the language model and the classifier, now we can use MCTS to decode uh, our language model by using the emotion classifier in this process, okay? So now for every time we are picking a new note or the next note, we're gonna run a search, uh, an MCTS search, okay? So MCTS is uh, a common, common search technique that is has four, four steps, selection, expansion, simulation, and back propagation. And next I'm gonna explain each one of these of this, um, processes in our work. So the selection method works um, with PUCT also. And, and here is the same equation, right? So we're gonna select a leaf node in, uh, in our search tree that, um, that um, maximizes the following, the following formula, where here in our case, key, key, key values are computed by the music emotion classifier and the PU values are given by the language model. So you can think of the language model as the policy network and, and the Q values as <clears throat> the reward of, of taking the action out, right? And okay, so the expansion procedure simply adds that selected node to, to the tree, to the search tree, and then it initializes the statistics of that note. Uh, so, for example, we have the number of visits of that note is is one, and now <clears throat> we haven't uh, explored any 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 action from here, so it's zero, and we don't we haven't computed any values from here. So, next step is simulation, which pretty much simply uh, computes the <clears throat> the Q value of that note uh, using the music emotion classifier. Okay, so here what you're computing is the Q of N to L, okay, which is this one. So we, we, we get this value by computing the E is the emotion classifier. So we compute M towards the target emotion E. And we increase one visit uh, from N to M here, okay? Um, okay. So the last step is a backpropagation step where we backpropagate the Q values from N all the way up to the root of that path uh, of generation, okay? So the updating here uh, pretty much computes the, the average of Q values for each node and it increases the number of visits, okay? So after running MCTS for a certain number of iterations, let's say for, for this node here, at the very end, if you wanna pick the next node, what we do is we sample from this distribution here, right? Which is the number of visits. And that was supposed to give us a better approximation for the policy, which in our case, um, <clears throat> you can think of this as we are steering the language model towards that uh, given emotion. So to evaluate this model, uh, what we did was we, we have a quality listening test and here we, we give human subjects a, a, an introduction of a piece, and then they had to listen to two different continuations, one for, from each system. And, and then we asked two, two, two we asked, asked one question, sorry, which, which of the two continuations is more musical? And they had to pick uh, uh, an answer from this Likert scale from one to five, uh, where one means left continuation is more musical, three is a tie, five means that the right continuation is more musical. And at the end, they had to write a short sentencing, a sh sentence justifying their choice. <clears throat> um, so to, to do this experiment, to generate 10 pieces for each emotion. And we have four different, four different models here being compared. First one obviously is MCTS. We have top K, SBBS, and the human, the human, human composed pieces. So each model had 40 pieces, 10 for each emotion. Okay, so in total 160 pieces. So this pairwise comparison that we did is follows the methodology proposed by Juan Ghetto. Okay. Um, and we, because this was also done in Amazon Mechanical Turk, uh, we filtered out some participants um, just to make sure we didn't get too much noise in the answers. So the filtering process was 
um, based on the sentence of justification, we, we, we removed every single person who only wrote sentences that, that had like less, less than, than five uh, words. And also there was a test before, before this um, main question, which was um, very similar to this, this continuation here. Okay, so these are the results for the pairwise comparison, okay? <clears throat> so let's look at the SBBS results first. Uh, obviously, I think as, as expected, the humans, uh, human composed pieces beat, uh, they outperformed SBBS, they had better quality, um, or they were preferred more. Um, so top K pieces uh, here, if you compare to human pieces, again, human pieces were preferred against uh, top K pieces, but, the, the people, the human studies prefer the top cake pieces a little bit more over SBBS, okay? For MCTS here, we have uh, the following. Uh, against human pieces, right, we, we also, um, people, people also prefer the human pieces uh, as expected, but we outperform SBBS uh, quite, quite well, actually, and um, <clears throat> And the quality of compared of, of MCTS compared to top K was a very similar, exactly the same, actually. Okay, so this is interesting. It shows that uh, in terms of quality, we outperform as BBS, but we perform as similar to similar to top K. Okay. So next we evaluate the emotion of uh, that people perceive in this in this um, generated pieces. And the idea here is to to ask human subjects to annotate these pieces using that annotation tool of the VGMT data set. Okay, here we had three subjects per, per piece. <clears throat> so here's the results for top K. And here's interesting, uh, top K doesn't, doesn't control for emotion. Right? Top K sampling doesn't, doesn't have any emotion control method, but it kind of like still, it still performs relatively well, right? especially on emotions E0 and E3 here. And, but it performs very bad in emotions E1 and E2. And this can be explained by the fact that emotions E0, which are kind of happy and excited and, and whatnot, they are uh, the, the majority in, in video game music and, and especially in our data set. And the same is, I think the second majority or the second top, second top uh, type of music is in the, in the E3 category, okay? Which is kind of calm music, okay? The two main, the, this, the second two other emotions, uh, E1 and E2, they have, we have way less, less instances in our data set. So that's why top K performed uh, very well, very bad. So for SVBS, uh, so SVBS outperform, as expected, outperform top K uh, for all the emotions quite well, um, having an average accuracy of 52%. And finally, MCTS outperform SBBS for emotions E0, E1, and E2, um, and it lost or to to SBBS for emotions E3. Okay, <clears throat> and but on average, actually, we perform slightly better than SBBS. Okay, so now let's hear to some music, and so the first one here is an example of excited piece. And, and this is a nice piece because it starts with the Tetris theme. So if you know Tetris, you're going to recognize this, but you can see how the piece completely differently and, and keeps, but keeps this excited uh, kind of emotion. For the sake of time, I'm just going to play another example, which I like a lot as well, which is uh, this one, which comes from Legend of Zelda, and this is a sad piece. Nice, okay. So concluding this work, we presented a MCTS with PUCT for generating music with a target emotion. 
And we saw that MSTS generates music that is as good as Top K and better than SBBS. And MSTS is better than SBBS at controlling motions. Okay, finally, let me quickly conclude this talk uh, by putting my thesis statement again, and let's, let's look back at it. And when I started, I mentioned that this dissertation explores how to control neural language models to generate music with a target emotion. Given the limitation of labeled data, the focus of this work is on search-based methods that use a music emotion classifier to steer the distribution of pre-trained musical language models. Okay, so let me highlight the contributions of this dissertation, at least the major ones. Now we have the VG Media data set, which has 200 labeled pieces, 3,640 unlabeled piano pieces, and which comes with an annotation tool for labeling pieces according to circumplex model. Uh, we have we, we presented two different encoding schemes, one compact and one expressive for representing media pieces. And we presented three different search-based methods to control neural language models to generate music with a target emotion. So these are the publications that are related to this work that I did uh, throughout my, my time here at UCSC. And thank you. Thank you uh, very much for everyone who listened, uh, everyone who is here. Thank you for the reading committee again. Um, this is a link to my repository where you can get um, all the search code and data to reproduce this work. Okay, thank you very much. And now I'm open to take questions.